Welcome, everybody. Welcome to this first lecture in Rare Book School's 2021 summer series. Uh, my name is Michael Suarez. I have the great privilege of being the director of Rare Book School, and we're delighted to have such a great turnout. I see from the Zoom that there's a cascade of people coming in, and how fittingly that they should come out in such tremendous numbers for tonight's speaker. This evening's speaker, Alex Hidalgo, is Associate Professor of Latin American History at Texas Christian University. He holds a PhD from the University of Arizona, where he developed his scholarly interests in print and manuscript culture, ethnography, collecting, and critical cartography. His first book, Trail of Footprints, a history of indigenous map making from viceregal Mexico is an analysis of Mesoamerican and Spanish ideas of placemaking, memory, and knowledge that received many excellent reviews. As one scholar opined, Hidalgo's meticulously researched clearly written and generously illustrated study is both innovative and informative. Professor Hidalgo's second book, Mexican Soundscapes of the Colonial Era, now in progress, considers the ways that ethnic diversity and racial difference influenced understandings of sound and of listening. Professor Hidalgo has received support for his scholarship from the Library of Congress, the Ford Foundation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I recently read a fascinating article of his on ink making, how to map with ink, cartographic materials in colony, from colonial Oaxaca, and I recommend it to you. It's a really interesting uh, treatment of material culture. Professor Hidalgo is, I am proud to profess, a junior fellow in Rare Book School's Andrew W. Mellon Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. His talk this evening is entitled, The Book as Archive. Please join me in virtually welcoming him. Hello, everyone. Michael, thank you. That is such a wonderful introduction. Um, I am thrilled and excited to be here with all of you this evening. Can everybody hear me okay? Can I see a few thumbs up just to make sure? Thank you. I appreciate it. I am grateful to be presenting this particular work this evening with you because back in 2017, this particular piece that, you, that I will be presenting tonight started off as a very blatant attempt to ingratiate myself with the Society of Fellows in Critical Bibliography. I wanted to form part of that group. I had read about their platform, their approach to the study of books in critical bibliography. And I felt that the sorts of questions that I was asking in my own material uh, fit with the mission that that group had. And they were holding a conference in Philadelphia on bibliography among the disciplines. And I took it as a personal task to develop this paper so that they could perhaps take a look at me and perhaps consider me as part of an individual who might contribute to that society. Fast forward to spring of last year as I was ending a very difficult semester as we all were in May, but yet starting a sabbatical and the prospect of leaping into a second book project from scratch seemed unfathomable. I think the prospect of working on something that seemed much more manageable and perhaps already started gave me an impetus to work on the, what I'm going to be presenting on this evening. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, there we go. 
So in the course of research a few years ago at the Biblioteca Francisco de Burgoa in Oaxaca City, I came across a rare copy of the Rerum Medicarum Nova España, an early edition of the 16th century Compendium of Mexican Plants by the physician and naturalist Francisco Hernandez. This influential work informed my analysis of the flora and fauna used to make pigments to illustrate maps and other pictorial records. It has over 900 pages, including, as you can see, a striking frontispiece depicting Amerindians, a map of New Spain, and various royal emblems. But what captivated me the most about the 17th century work was a handwritten folio sewn into the entrails of the book that had not formed part of the original printing. The intriguing insert recounted the 1741 stillbirth of conjoined twins in Oaxaca's Central Valley, a rich and fertile region in the southern reaches of the Viceroyalty of New Spain. The folio tells of the story of Pascuala Chavez, a Zapotec woman from a small town at, uh, named Santa Catarina Quijene, who delivered conjoined twins on June 14th of that year. Miguel de Castro, the Dominican friar who penned the account, observed that Chavez finished giving birth having started at eight in the evening of the previous day to a dead girl with two heads, perfect in every way. He pointed out that the body had a sort of small little arm with what looked like a little finger in between both heads, a detail gleaned from the printed image of the body pasted on the backside of the page. The unusual birth mobilized a group of specialists who took possession of the corpse and transported it to the city of Oaxaca for inspection by the Bishop of Antequera, the, Regis, the region's highest religious authority. A surgeon performed an autopsy of the remains and later embalmed the corpse. Castro chose purposely to attach the report next to a description of a two-headed calf, observing, because it is such a rare case, I place the record in this book by Francisco Hernandez next to the description of a similar monster with a stamp pasted here of said girl delivered in this city. In the priest's estimation, filing this moment among a series of similar themes in a sturdy book would help ensure the survival of the account while also giving it meaning. Readers in Europe and America in the early modern period deposited a wide range of things inside books, spectacles, book plates, legal documents, flowers, hair, and other ordinary objects found homes between the pages of books sharing space with statements of property, annotations, drawings, doodling, or the occasional curse inscribed by a reader. Because these things do not constitute a formal part of a book, catalogers have struggled with ways of recognizing and describing such data in bibliographic records. By mere accident, do we encounter these fragments of the past when on the road to another destination? But what happens when we stop to look more closely? What do the material aspects of books tell us about the way people use books and how they stored memories. What made a record or object worthy to preserve in a book? In the case of colonial Mexico, the insertion of the report into the Rerum Medicarum represents a distinct form of archival practice in which books served as receptacles to register exceptional moments of daily life, comment on reading and ritual, and capture spatial coordinates designed to fix objects in space and time. My study applies lessons from our archival theory and critical bibliography to consider the formation of archives outside of state-sponsored efforts to administer social interaction and to rethink the role of early books beyond the normative function of the ordered text. A book's size and material condition made it a perfect storage vessel to collect memories, 
documents and illustrations. The report of the birth of conjoined twins formed part of an informal mechanism designed to account for a range of experiences that fell outside institutional forms of record keeping and surveillance. Books offered a way to classify the unfiltered voices and actions of those who deliberately repurposed their pages, boards, and edges into scaled down archives complete with imposing doors, protective walls, ample storage units, and multiple filing units. Herrero Medicarum is one of several early editions that published the findings of 16th century physician and naturalist Francisco Hernández. In 1570, King Philip II commissioned Hernández to document the plants, minerals, and animals of New Spain, a journey that ended in 1577 and resulted in a 16-volume work titled Natural History of New Spain. Hernández's groundbreaking study offered commentary on hundreds of specimens. He paid close attention to their properties, habitat, and use, and included illustrations of botanical specimens made by indigenous artists. The physician relied on the knowledge shared by native botanists and healers with whom he dealt with while also testing the properties of plants on himself, often with painful results. In his taxonomy, the doctor avoided Latinizing or Hispanicizing terms. Instead, he named plants in Nahuatl, the language most spoken in central Mexico. The compilation of Hernandez's works appeared in a robust illustrated tome published in Rome in 1649. The book size, 13 inches by eight and a half inches, and four to five pounds made it an imposing physical object. The distressed black leather covers with torn edges of the Burgoa copy disguised an elaborate design framed in gold that greeted each user. Printers typically bound a small number of books for users who prefer to finish product, but left others stored in sheets to allow patrons to supply their own bindings. Within the Rerum Medicarum's covers, in-text woodcut illustrations, single-page engravings, and woodcut initials accompany entries of a majority of the specimens described. An analysis of New Spain's biodiversity also provided insight into the animal kingdom, including medicinal properties of species such as iguanas, toads, and snakes. A reader would have come across a pap the paper insert in the section on fauna that Miguel de Castro carefully fastened between pages 626 and 627. The priest cut in half a standard sheet on which he described the 1741 birth of conjoined twins from Oaxaca, fitting it purposely next to the description of the two-headed calf. For readers, switching back and forth between the printed text of the book and the handwritten one of the report highlights the important manuscripts continued to play at the end of the 18th century as vehicles for the transmission of knowledge. Orderly handwriting on both sides of the page reveals Castro's familiarity with notarial conventions that structured the production of documents and record keeping practices in the vice royalty. The cutout of the conjoined twins that the priest pasted on the back of the page signals the role of print technologies that generated ephemeral materials of notable occurrences. The image helped maintain balance with the book's format of enhancing the text with illustrations. The insertion of the manuscript raises questions about how books ended up as bound objects on a shelf in Oaxaca. The Rerum Medicarum came to life in Europe, an important European printing hub with a healthy appetite for scientific and ethnographic studies that resulted from overseas exploration. Printing brought together punch cutters who cut letters in steel, 
compositors who set type, printers who applied ink and worked the press, paper makers who transformed rags and linens into writing surfaces of various sizes, tanners who cured different types of animal hides used for covers, and binders who assembled the books. Engravers and woodcutters supplied plates and boards used to embellish and augment the ordered text through imagery. A finished book reflected these collaborations through what Gerard Jeanette describes as paratexts, the written and visual conventions such as title pages, indices, tables of contents, printer's devices, errata, licenses, and illustrations that frame the main text and presented it to the world. Networks of merchants, bankers, aristocrats, navigators, missionaries, and collectors ensured books and other goods circulated widely across the Atlantic, where they eventually filled the bookcases of people and institutions in America. The copy of the Rerum Medicarum that holds the steel birth insert formed part of the collection of one of the many libraries of Oaxaca's extensive network of Dominican convents. Missionaries across New Spain used books and libraries to help inform religious practice and the ethnographic fieldwork involved in evangelization and pastoral care. Historians of the early Mexican book have scrutinized the ship's logs, postmortem estate inventories, public auction records, and lists of prohibited books to demonstrate the type and quantity of works that shared space with the Rerum Medicarum. Each convent in the realm had a minimum of 100 books in libraries that collected theological works, hagiographies, choir books, and religious manuals of various kinds, including confessionals, catechisms, and bilingual vocabularies. One could also find important works in classical literature, poetry, philosophy, and history alongside scientific treatises and zoology, medicine, and geography. Undoubtedly, the size of each library varied. The one in the convent of St. Francis in the heart of Mexico City, and the largest of its kind, had over 16,000 titles on its shelf in the 18th century while the library of the convent of the Society of Jesus in Oaxaca City contained nearly 3,000. Other copies of the Rerum Medicarum circulated in the Viceroyalty outside of structures of monastic society. One that once belonged to the Mexican apothecary Vicencio José de Roa had formed part of the collection of Captain José de la Mota, who upon taking possession of the book did so by inscribing his name over that of an earlier predecessor. Tracing the lives of printed objects allows us to envision the size and scope of the collections in Oaxaca and other parts of New Spain from which users purposefully selected books to transform them into archives. Physical exceptionalism generated a range of responses across different sectors in colonial society. The categories Castro used to describe the incident reference a girl, a single entity, that the priest also conceived as a monster or a monstruo. For an educated male reader of Spanish origin, such as Castro, a monster resulted from births that went against the regular order of nature. Monstrosity embodied imperfection, disproportionate size, and ugliness it could also evoke wonder and admiration. As the priest's report makes clear, the birth from Oaxaca elicited fascination from church officials, viceregal authorities, and medical practitioners who played a role in examining, embalming, and displaying the corpse over the course of several months. Responses in New Spain took on meaning based on local and regional political and social conditions. The birth of the conjoined twins compelled the bishop to transfer the body to Veracruz, where the Viceroy of New Spain had traveled to inspect construction of new port infrastructure. The Viceroy in turn had the body salted and transferred to Jesus of Nazareth Hospital, 
a prominent medical institution in Mexico City, where it went on temporary display. We can glean the fascination with physical exceptionalism and unusual births from a postscript that the Dominican friar included at the end of his report. Castro noted that the parish priest of Quijene, the town where Chavez delivered the conjoined twins, revealed he had baptized in the last year alone 20 pairs of twins, that is 40 people, and that is also memorable, he said. The town likewise boasted of a chicken with four wings and four claws. Physical exceptionalism proved a distinction that people welcomed with pride. Inserting the written account into the book represented one of several options used to archive reports of uncommon births and monsters. Illustrations of fantastic beasts in specialized treatises, including the Rerum Medicarum, allowed readers to visualize the possibilities of creatures that lay outside the natural world. The book included the two-headed two calf, as well as the skeleton of a Mexican dragon and a two-headed amphibian. Broadsides, like the one used to cut out the image of the conjoined twins, offered glimpses into the popular print media that captured the irregularity of human bodies. An uncut tarot deck printed in Mexico in 1583 by the cart maker Alonso Martinez de Ortegilla, likewise sig signals the way in which monstrous births inform ideas about difference. The sheet includes 18 cards that included a native in a trance, a juggler, a ritual pole flyer known as a volador, portraits of Moctezuma in Guatemoc, and the monster of Tulancingo, a deformed man of reputed violence whose legend grew with time. Reports of unusual births in New Spain found a wider audience at the end of the 18th century through the publication of gazettes that featured uncommon deliveries. Announcements of monstrous births and periodicals across the Hispanic world during this period gained a scientific and informative veneer that departed significantly from the Relaciones de Sucesos, the precursors of the newspaper. That Miguel de Castro selected a book to function as an archive should come as no surprise. If we think of the book as a physical space, an organized building in which to store things, the normative nature of the object changes significantly. The archive, argues Akil Membe, has neither power nor status without an architectural dimension. Castro's choice to insert the record of the birth of the conjoined twins in the Rerum Medicarum signals this very thing. Durable leather covers provided a safe haven in which to deposit the long report, the space between the pages of the lengthy book acting as folders in which to file an important memory. By selecting Hernandez's treatise on the natural world and choosing a section of the book that dealt with two-headed creatures, the priest crossed what Luciana Durante describes as the archival threshold, a space in a building where an authority figure takes possession of documents and makes selections about their destination within the archive. This process of authentication undertaken by Castro allowed the insert to also function as an extension of the book's text. One finds the same determination in the handwritten liturgical notes of an unnamed cleric who glued them between the front paste down and the title page of Diego de Santo Somas's Ceremonial y Manual Sacado del Misal Roman. The notes referenced the nature of the sacraments and they included scriptural citations that would help contextualize Santo Tomas's commentary on Pope Pius, Pius V's 1570 Roman Missal which standardized mass across the Catholic Church. A small layer of torn paper with traces of handwritten text at the end of the book between the rare paste down and the colophon 
indicates the cleric inserted another set of notes that someone later ripped out. Positioning the notes in the front and back, the two most important entry points for any book, suggest the user intended to provide a set of instructions for readers before crossing the threshold. Other occasions demanded a different set of archival considerations. When Orihuela, a priest from Ixlahuaca on the northern edges of the Valley of Oaxaca, needed of the Valley of Mexico, needed a place to store the records of tithe contribution he collected from parishioners, he turned to Luis de Neve Molinas, Reglas de Ortografía, Diccionario y Arte del Idioma Otomí. As an agent of the church during the independence era, Orihuela rec recorded on printed receipts dates, names of parishioners, and contribution amounts that helped keep track of money and people. To store the small but valuable records, Orihuela made use of Neve Molina's compact duodecimo, a book format designed for frequent use and traveled it fit comfortably in the palm of the hand. Neve y Molina's work, the first dedicated study of the Otomi language, would have been a helpful tool to have around with commuting with, when communicating with Otomi speaking parishioners, while its size made it an ideal storage unit. Vocabularies, bilingual confessional manuals, and catechisms in indigenous languages had played a pivotal role in spreading Catholicism in central New Spain, where regular and secular clergy relied on their content to convey doctrine and communicate about economic and religious matters. Local presses in Mexico City and Puebla printed these books, which lived in the shelves alongside such works as the Rerum Medicarum and passed via loan, gift, and theft from one individual to another. Books, in fact, archived peoples and places. Inscriptions with names, book plates of various sizes and design, and firebrands seared into the edges of books represent archival interventions designed to register personhood, location, and time. These common features of printed works that circulated in New Spain signal intentional patterns of use that took advantage of a book's physical condition to make statements about property, devotional practices, and politics. A copy of Juan Bautista's Admonitions for Confessors, a trilingual handbook for missionaries published in Mexico City, illustrate the way book users disrupted the ordered nature of printed media. Inside the book's front cover, a stamped book plate from the convent of St. Francis greeted users. The book plate's artist identified the convent's affiliation by drawing from well-known religious iconography. Five hearts representing the wounds of Christ on hands, feet, and side of chest, and the crossed emblem of Jesus and the Italian saint. More suggestively, the bottom portion of the plate included an eagle devouring a serpent on top of a cactus, a symbol with deep ties to Nahua culture, appropriated by the American-born Spanish elite to shape their identity within the Iberian world. The title page to the right includes a set of scratched out inscriptions surrounding the emblem of the Imperial College of Santa Cruz, an influential educational enterprise founded by Franciscans in 1536, designed to train the children of the native elite for governance according to European principles. The contrast between the imposing book plate on the left and the effaced inscription on the right points to the material practices involved in claiming dominion over books. The custom including erases, erasing traces of past users. Two additional inscriptions of ownership and an iron branding along the book's tail edge reflect the interactions taking place on the physical structure of the book. Zeb Tortorici theorizes that the archive represents a contact zone where time and people, archive subjects, scribes, archivists, and historians 
interface in transformative ways that document, erase, and consume information. Thinking of books as self-contained buildings that supply space for such exchanges to happen invites us to reimagine the inscription of names, dates, and places as rituals of possession rooted in fear and distrust that established momentary control of objects by ink and fire. Users sometimes transformed the printed page in notarial ledgers that recorded traumatic episodes. In the margins of a copy of Jose Antonio de Villaseñor's Teatro Americano, a political geography of New Spain published in Mexico City that also circulated in the libraries of Oaxaca, an unnamed scribe commented on a destructive string of natural disasters. On July 4th, 1760, a water spout hit and ruined the entire city, tearing down an unknown number of houses. Many people died. The placement of the inscription in the book's sixth chapter on the mining town of Guanajuato leaves little doubt of the correlation between print and manuscript. One finds here a powerful statement of material loss, economic insecurity, and death stated with the cool detachment of a notary. In the margins of a chapter on the bishopric of Guadalajara, the same scribe described a storm that produced hailstones of up to 12 pounds that shattered windows and tore down brick structures. In a nearby town, the annotator commented, the storm killed many mules and cows and left neither crow nor bird in the trees. Recording the memory of traumatic episodes such as natural disasters relied on the same notarial formulas and archival strategies that structured the insertion of the manuscript of the birth of conjoined twins. Finding things in books as part of an accidental process of discovery in the present does not equal random acts by historical actors in the past. Archiving, proposes Antoinette Burton, is not limited to institutional collecting or state efforts. Scholars, she observed, have interpreted historical evidence off of any number of different archival incarnations or centuries. Simply because we can never determine the nature of the square figure that resided between pages 296 and 297 in Juan de Josep's collection of sermons to celebrate the Virgin of the Incarnation does not mean the permanent imprint it left on the pages has lost value. The stain speaks volumes about the way people archived moments, places, and things, and how they manipulated the physicality of books to suit their needs. If anything, Readers and users of books tended to display rather predictable patterns of behavior. The instinct to claim ownership over property, the propensity to record things on a page, and the desire to reuse materials. In telling the story of Pascuala Chavez and the conjoined twins, the priest from Oaxaca responded to each of these impulses. The deliberate act of fastening the report to the book's spine serves as a fitting reminder that understanding the relationship between print and manuscript can mean the difference between memory and oblivion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex, for that really rich and um, highly detailed talk. Um, I know that um, this has been a real treat for the people tuning in. Um, and we are now going to begin the Q&A session. Um, I do invite um, all the people who are tuning in right now to please um, enter your questions into the chat, uh, because there's quite a, li a lot to talk about here. Um, and I already see one question coming in from our own uh, Deborah J. Leslie. So um, 
I'll go ahead and share that question and relay it, but do please keep sending your questions along. So Deborah Leslie asks, what was the physical mechanism, Alex, for affixing the manuscript on conjoined twins to the bound volume? I see. So if we're thinking about, I, I, I mean, I think the question is, so how did it wind up in the manuscript, right? And so it's cut out and some adhesive is placed on there. Um, I, I think that's part of the question. The other part, which I think is trickier, uh, and I can't, my knowledge does not take me far enough along to see exactly how the page was inserted. It seems to me to have been stitched the folio itself inside, uh, but I, I cannot, uh, I have, I have not been able to look into the entrails of that book deep enough to see, but I'm not sure if that answers the question. Um, no, that's great. Thank you. Um, and we have more questions coming through, so we'll just keep, keep the conversation going. Um, Robin Jensen reaches out with another question. She writes, archival theory discusses the lack of neutrality within the archives. I would love to have you share your thoughts on the power dynamics when looking at books as archives. Thanks, Robin, for that question. Thank you. Uh, deep, profound question. Um, I, I think you're right. I think part of what I'm trying to do, and I don't know if this is side, sidestepping the theory question in part because of the way that I approach thinking about archival theory in general. Uh, for me, the power relationship that was taking place here uh, had more to do with the printed nature of the book and the fact that the annotations and the things that are placed within books has received much less attention. And so there is a hierarchical way in which books have been interpreted and used across time. And so the Part of the point that I'm trying to make and which I'm relying here on the archival theory is to help us think through those power dynamics in different ways. Why did a priest insert it in a book? Why couldn't he take it to one of the notaries? Why did he feel that that particular manuscript had to be archived in a very specific way? To me, that's where the, the, the notion of power in the archives is really playing out and how it's shaping these relationships with people and the materiality of books themselves. Thanks, Alex. I'll, I'll follow up with a question of my own. Mm -hmm. So many of the features that you were showing us um, were are, um, like you say, you know, elusive and, you know, typical conception of a book might not, you know, account for those. But at the same time, um, the rare book and manuscript section um, of um, ALA, for example, has these wonderful controlled vocabularies um, that allow for this kind of description. And interestingly, you know, that's, a, that's something that's been cultivated within the world of rare books and special collections and not within archival communities per se, because mm -hmm. it, it's kind of native to, to what we find and discover in books. So is there, you know, I guess the question is, is there a way that the work that special collections librarians and rare book um, historians who've been working on these kinds of questions and vocabularies, is there something that um, can inform archival practice, kind of flipping the notion as it were, given that there, there are efforts to kind of um, describe those as, as elusive and tricky as those phenomena are? You know, I, I think the, the two things that I'm thinking about with that question, Barbara, is that despite the fact that I see so many parallels, say, between bibliographic work and archival work, they seem to be very separate worlds in, in many respects. And so um, one, one of the things that I was hoping to achieve with this is to push the idea of especially, so part of the historiographical base for this piece is centered on my own research on ethno history. 
uh, in the region of Mexico during the colonial period, which was, it, it's seen a tremendous growth in uh, the study of native language sources, it's particularly, particularly manuscripts. And so that's, that's generated an ethnographical discussion over several decades. That's also had an unintended consequence in that books themselves have been seen as an old type of study, and we're mm. all familiar with that, that sort of discussion, right? And uh, one of the goals of this piece is to show how books can be read in different ways, how the materiality of books, the annotations, the book plates, how they all have very particular material meaning that inform relationships that historians have not really been privy to, especially in my particular area of the world. Thanks, Alex. That's really helpful. Um, we have a slew of additional questions in the chat. Thank you, everyone, for um, sharing your thoughts and your, your um, queries. We have a question in from B. Williams um, Ellertson, who asks, would you talk a little about cataloging protocols for insertions into books, especially for sheets that would not have been part of the original edition? Should these insertions have their own individual record? Well, in many ways, I would say yes. Um, so here's one thing that I was thinking about. Um, because I realize, especially as you mentioned, Barbara, that there is a, a, a stronger push to account for these types of things and that the rare book community in particular, or the rare book uh, curating community in particular has been moving there. I agree, um, but there are, there are limits and I understand and there are so many things. So for instance, the, the insert, the main insert, that's cataloged in the library where I found it. It's not an unknown thing. Uh, people know that it exists and it has a kind of entry. But in the same library, another book with the annotations on the natural disaster, that's not cataloged. And that is very rich and extensive text. I, I would say in cases like that, it would merit uh, uh, it its own individual record. Okay, great. Um, Cynthia Gibson. Um, um, has a non-archival question to ask. She says, you mentioned Hernandez used Natwal um, words to name things in the Rera Medicarum. Did he speak the language or did he use phonetic spellings or dot, 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 <laughs> question mark? Um, if phonetic, was he the first to put those into print? Uh, okay, um, so he spoke Nahuatl, and he learned the language through his indigenous informants. The book was written um, with that nomenclature. Uh, and then the other part of that question was, was this the first? Uh, so missionaries had been working with Nahuatl from the very moment of contact. And a number of vocabularies were printed around that period of the 1560s and 1570s. There might have been some earlier, I can't remember the exact dates, but certainly in that last uh, 25 years of the 16th century, we see a high volume of works uh, and moving into the early 17th century that uh, are printed using uh, indigenous languages and not only Nahuatl, but Zapotec and Mixtec and different variants of Maya. And so it becomes one of the uh, part and parcels of the printing industry in Mexico. Uh, it's also a really interesting and I would say under-examined topic because it involves many relationships that coming out it from a uh, uh, a subdisciplinary outsider's perspective are just counterintuitive. Uh, in that we have uh, indigenous people working in the print shops. Uh, we've got collaboration with translation going on. Uh, in fact, uh, many of the pupils from the, this college that I mentioned, the Santa Cruz College, uh, would be annotators and reviewers, service peer reviewers for many of these works 
for their Franciscan brethren who they collaborated with, sometimes voluntarily and other times not so much. It's that it, there we should not remember that or not forget that this is a colonial environment and that Franciscans are engaging in these practices precisely to break down indigenous culture and indigenous religion. Yes. Um, no, it's it's such an important point um, and a sobering one um, to reflect on. Um, um, turning to a different kind of question, Margaret Boyle writes um, with this query, can you talk about books as archives in relationship to your work in progress on soundscapes? <laughs> I would love to hear more about tracing sound and silence and multilingualism, say dictionaries across texts. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I am, the, the piece that is, that I've developed the most is a study on voices. And uh, I examined the voice as a category of analysis of, on its own, and not so much speech, but rather uh, screams and sobbing and laughter. And I am looking particularly um, at printed uh, culture from Mexico to trace the way that institutions um, sought to police the way that voices were uh, used. And so, uh, for instance, they encourage certain types of singing, they encourage silence in certain moments. We can look at this uh, very closely when we're thinking about mass. So mass becomes one of the most important changes to happen in Mesoamerica after the arrival of Spaniards. There are daily masses and mass churches with bells, with a whole ritual that includes voices and silence playing at different moments. Sometimes people speak, sometimes people respond. And so we can see in print culture how voices are regulated, what's expected, but we can also see in these studies how people are pushing back. Uh, friars are writing about the frustration that they feel that these people just won't shut up during the most important parts of the mass, right? They just don't know, or they're pushing the boundaries, right? It's a way to resist the authority of the missionaries by laughing, by chatting, by murmur. And all these are ways that we can think about how colonialism functions, but also about the way that we tend to think of history some ways as a, as a mute process. We, 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 we see the images, but they're still, uh, and this is the way for me, and I think Margaret described it really well, of tracing sound in the archive. And so I think that's one of the interventions that I'm, that I'm comfortable with sharing that I'm making right now. How fascinating, Alex. And yeah, I'm glad that question was asked because there are so many resonances with what you were getting at in this talk too. Um, so thank you again, Margaret. Um, the questions keep coming in, so um, we'll continue. Um, our next um, uh, uh, a lecture participant would like to know, um, well, first of all, thanks you for a very rich talk. Um, and says, did indigenous peoples in the region have an archival theory into which to further contextualize the lessons about archiving in your research? Wow, what a great Fascinating question. What a great question. Uh, yes, so the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, and there are many strands of archiving that took place. And so it, it, since you asked specifically about indigenous people, I'll speak about that first. So there are different types of archives. There are family archives, and then there are what I would describe as maybe municipal or town council archives. There are confraternity archives like lay religious brotherhoods. So institutions will store their own documents. Towns in particular are very strict about keeping records, not so much because of the books and so forth, they've got other considerations. They've got encroachment on land taking place specifically in the late 17th and 18th century that is pushing against their boundaries uh, and jurisdictions. And so it behooves them to keep very well and detailed archives so that if the time comes, they can produce records. So the Spanish empire is built on paper and keeping effective records is one of the ways in which they do that. Um, 
they're also weary about non-indigenous or I would maybe say Spaniards and Euro Europeans. In, in my book, In Trail of Footprints, I examined the case of an Italian who traveled through central Mexico trying to collect pictorial records and so forth. And one of the things that struck me as I was doing research for that was his description of the insularity of indigenous people in relation to their archives and the way that uh, they uh, resented, feared, and also distrusted outsiders. And so for years he tried, eventually he succeeded, but through different means, but it took him so much uh, time, effort, and money to try to penetrate those archives because these indigenous groups did not give up their manuscripts easily. Wow, thank you, Alex. Um, we have more questions and this one is circling back to an earlier question. <clears throat> this one comes from uh, Regina Regina um, Heberlein. Um, she asks, um, is anything known about the reception of this document that would allow conclusions about the intent of the insertion beyond archiving it, e.g. as a means to publicize the event of the birth of conjoined twins and or control its meaning? Well, I, I think maybe the way that I would answer that uh, is the several specific things that the priest includes in the document. So it's not exactly, I think, what the question is asking, but I find it incredibly suggestive that this document was prepared, what I'm assuming is at least about a year after the birth take place, takes place, even though the date is not recorded, because of what the priest describes that happens. So it's not just the baby was born, it was born dead, but rather it was born, they took it to the capital of, of Oaxaca. From there, they, they sent it to the Viceroy all the way to Veracruz. It came back to Mexico City. It was displayed for a long time and so many people came to see the display. That is clear language that this notion or, or this event circulated and that it reached a wide audience, right? In this case, it's moving through three very urban, uh, very important urban areas in New Spain. And it makes it so much that the priest feels obligated a year after everything has happened to take note of it and then to put it in the book itself. So to me, that indicates the way that information was circulating, that it was also the broadsides were produced about the image, right? And so we only see one and it was pasted, but that's also very suggestive. Surely they just did not print one. Uh, they they, they circulate. So there's a number of inferences I think that we can make from that particular document. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, it looks like we have one last question. This one coming from Beth Yale. And she says, super fascinating, Alex. I was wondering if you could comment on wonder, curiosity, fascination with monsters like the infant you discuss from European and ind indigenous perspectives. How do you think this fascination was changing in the context of the colonial contact zone? Um, and then she asks a follow-up question. How can we see impact of indigenous agency in shaping this curiosity? Sure, okay. Um, so I, I, what scholars, and this is, I'm basing this on the scholarship of uh, others who have also examined this theme very deeply. And so I think what the, what the answer to that is that there is a shift from a, perhaps more uh, traditional way of thinking of monsters, right? So monsters as calamities, monsters as omens of disaster. Uh, and it shifts in the 18th century to ideas about wonder and excitement uh, and regional identity. Um, according to uh, the historian Martha Few, these things also have very 
deeply embedded regional circumstances that shape the discussions around these pieces. So for instance, many of the monstrous births that are announced are non-Spanish um, births. And so there seems to be an indication that there's much more a fascination with, an, with the indigenous body, a tradition that kind of moves through the colonial period. And so that is a sort of consistency. So what can we learn from these indigenous bodies? They're different from us. Look, now they, you know, you see these monsters. And, um, and so I think in that way, we, we notice different types of shifts, enlightenment thought in the second uh, portion of the 18th century that moves away from the sort of portent omen kind of discussion into, no, this is just a different way of thinking about how births are taking place. Thank you. Um, and that's, I'm, I, I'm grateful to Beth for sharing that question. Um, it looks like we have time for one more, and there is one more if we can slip it in um, within the few remaining minutes we have. Um, Cynthia Gibson writes, she's also curious about the pasted in illustration itself from that broadside that you were talking mm -hmm. about. She mm -hmm. asked, was it printed and hand colored? Was, uh, why was the cutout heart shaped? And she asked, or are we giving that a modern lens? I don't think we're giving it a modern lens. I think to me, it looks pretty clear that it's heart shaped. Now, I don't know that heart shape means love. If that is, you know, the modern lens, I'm not going as far as to saying that. I'm just suggesting that it's cut in the shape of a heart, that it looks pretty clear to me. Um, and then the other question, remind me, Barbara, uh, the um, other part of that question. Was it printed and hand colored? Oh, I see. That's a good question. As far as I could tell, it was not hand colored, but I don't know. So the, the, that raises a really important question. There is a print shop in Oaxaca at this point. There is a printer, um, but it's in the city. It's very possible that it got printed there but there isn't any other record. And so I just, I, I don't know whether it, I, it would seem logical to me that it was produced in the region since this was a regional occurrence. And since Oaxaca had access to a printer, it is likely that it was printed there. Beyond that, I just am not sure. Well, thank you again for this q and It's been fantastic having this time to speak with you um, and to have this really robust conversation. I know that um, our, uh, our participants are really eager to speak with you. Um, many of you have seen in the chat um, that there is a link to our gather town space and um, you can meet with our speaker uh, there to discuss things further. We encourage you to do so. And for those of you who are not familiar with gather town, um, we are going to shift and I will provide um, a very brief overview of how that space works. But if you are already familiar with Gather Town or you just want to dive in, um, then you, you don't need to stick around. Um, the, the main point is make sure you're using Chrome. Otherwise, you really won't be able to use Gather Town effectively. Um, we still have people um, joining the talk. So if you just if you just signed into this talk, we are wrapping up the Q&A and we are shifting the conversation to informal talk in Gather Town. I wanna thank our wonderful speaker, Alex Hidalgo, one more time for his, um, his lecture and for, again, this really wonderful conversation. So I am uh, virtually applauding um, you, Alex, and we are, again, um, so pleased to have had you speak with us tonight.